If you were searching for the best source text on European customs and culture in the 18th century, you would inevitably find yourself reading The Story of My Life by Giacomo Casanova. And instead of some dense, weighty binding full of face-smacking boredom and lessons on dinner etiquette, you would soon be reading about a man who sharpened the skill of seduction to the point of a profession, one who schemed, scammed, and gambled with the nobility, conned ladies with promises of occult wisdom, fought in duels, won the hearts of countless beautiful women, and stole the pleasure of some girls far too young to mention. You would read of amorous escapades in Venetian carnival masks, of dinner parties with royalty and famous intellectuals, of prison sentences and a series of travels undertaken by a man who could show up in a city with nothing but an expensive wardrobe and soon find himself in the favor of the gentry, bantering about classic literature while enjoying the benefit of another man's coin purse, and just as soon find himself banished from the city. This man was the best-known womanizer playboy in the 18th century, and he was born in Venice in 1725 to parents who were both actors and wanted him to become a priest. He writes the memoirs of his life, saying, I'm writing my life to laugh at myself, and I am succeeding. And he explains that, I begin by informing my reader that for everything good or bad that I've done throughout my life, I'm certain I have always earned due approbation or reproof and must therefore consider myself a free man. The story begins with Casanova at eight years old, watching blood pour out of his nose with a strange sickness. His grandmother rows him in a gondola to a witch's hovel outside of Venice. There he sees the old crone with a black cat in her lap. The witch lays him down, burning incense, reciting incantations, rubbing him down with oils. She tells him his bleeding will soon subside if he follows her guidelines, and tells him a lady will visit him in the night. That night back home, Casanova has a visit from a dazzling woman, a fairy over his bed wearing a jewel-studded crown, who speaks to him in a language he doesn't know. She kisses him, vanishes, and he falls back asleep. The next day, his grandmother believes he'll die, but three months later is somewhat recovered and has learned to read. And in his second memory, he and his younger brother Francesco are watching their father work in his study. Casanova finds a crystal ball and is charmed to put it in his pocket. When his father can't find the crystal and is distressed, threatening to search them, Casanova writes, After pretending to look for the crystal in every corner of the room, I adroitly slipped it into my brother's pocket. Their father finds it in Francesco's pocket and belts him. Six weeks later, his father dies due to a doctor's mistaken attempt to cure him of an illness. My father died in his prime at the age of 36, said Casanova. After his death, the idea of Casanova being raised to be an actor is sworn off. Casanova once again falls ill, being weak and without an appetite. Soon he is taken to Padua for his care, and he thinks this is his family getting rid of him. While he's boarded at the house of Dr. Gazzi, he has his first brush with love at 11 and 12 years old, Dr. Gazzi's 13-year-old sister, Bettina. Bettina would come to his bed in the mornings and brush his hair, giggle over his bedside, brushing his skin and caressing him. The young Casanova soon becomes acquainted with the animal instincts of arousal and has no idea what to make of them but is displeased that he is too nervous or ignorant to know how to handle her. By now, Casanova has excelled in his school lessons and is assigned to look over the work of other students around him. He fancies himself better and wittier than his contemporaries, especially in the case of a 15-year-old boy, Candiani. As Bettina's playfulness begins to go further, she and Casanova kiss, and yet Bettina becomes more interested in Candiani. The 12-year-old Casanova one night invites Bettina to his bedchamber at midnight, fancying he can finally get her in his arms how he should. But he waits and waits until near sunrise and she doesn't come. He is furious and Candiani finds him outside and kicks him in the stomach. It is announced in the house that Bettina is actually dying, but Casanova is so enraged by now he's considering 
poisoning both of them, but never actually takes such a drastic action. Later, Bettina threatens him, saying to come to a ball with me dressed as a girl or I shall make you cry. Casanova refuses, and he has learned Bettina was receiving Candiani and two of his friends into bed. And he is met with the first brush of betrayal and a blow to his young love, but no doubt a lesson he will always remember. At the age of 16, he becomes a doctor while studying law in Padua. But it didn't take long before law became the primary pursuit because of his abilities in public speaking. But even then, he never practices either profession and claims to have never called on doctors or lawyers for aid. But while he was at the university, Casanova begins to consider himself a free man and made a point to make the acquaintance of the most notorious students, the libertines, gamblers, whoremongers, and drunks. The, quote, ruiners of honest girls, the violent, the false, and all those incapable of nurturing the slightest sentiment of virtue. It was in the company of fellows of this sort that I began to know the world by studying it in the harsh book of experience. Taking up this new strategy of learning, Casanova learns what it is to gamble away one's money, to bear troubles and fall into traps. I learned to mistrust all those who praise you to your face and never to count on the offers made by flatterers. He determines from this education in the nightlife that those who pick quarrels should be avoided and sees how among the privileged classes there are usually no lasting punishments incurred. In fact, to maintain their status, they often commit crimes themselves. At a local coffee house, a police officer enters and a student tells him to leave. The officer scoffs at the man and the student fires a pistol and misses. The officer fires back and kills the student, inciting a university-wide union among the students who search for officers to murder. This escalated to the point that the Venetian government had to get involved. Casanova, too, ignores the advice of his landlord and takes up a rifle with his fellow students, seeking to hunt their common foe, but disappointed when they found none. Now he returns to Venice, having completed his studies, and is introduced to others with this description of education. This makes him the subject of attraction to women and the heads of families. Now he's back living in what was his father's large and well-furnished house with his brother, Francesco, and takes on new tutors to continue his studies. He becomes attached to a former senator, Signor Malipiero, and dines with him in the company of rich and witty ladies. The senator is a bachelor and lives the lifestyle as such, having some 20 mistresses well into his 70s. But when certain ladies left the old man without a climax, Casanova was there to hear his sullen reflections and soon becomes the old man's favorite teenager. And Casanova, in the company of the old partying gentry, learns the two faces of polite society at a rapid pace. He charms the old women, meets and flirts with their daughters and nieces, and develops his wits and relations. In just a few days, he says, I became a darling of all the ladies. Once a local priest offers Casanova the chance to give an oration in his church, but when Casanova presents this oration, which he finds to be excellent, the father and the priest says it's too controversial and they won't let it be spoken. Casanova explains that if the church will have none of it, he'll have it published. Thank you, Reverend Father, but I prefer to deliver my own or not at all. He reads this to Signor Malapiero's dinner guests and they applaud him unanimously. He ends up reading the sermon at the San Samuel Church at 15 years old to a widespread applause. With this, he becomes determined to be a preacher and spends more time with Father Ticello of the church and falling in love with his daughter, Angela. But when the time came to read his new anticipated sermon, he thinks he can memorize it, which he doesn't. So when he's on the pulpit in front of a larger audience, he forgets his lines, rambles, and falls on his face with embarrassment. And that was the last time young Casanova gave a sermon. In the next year, he designs his love and seductions for Angela but it soon becomes a torment. She denies him at every chance, but wants him to leave the church and become his wife. He grew skinny with his despair and comments that at this stage of life he respected a virgin's innocence. He says, I wanted nothing to do with married women. What stupidity. Not long after this, a housekeeper's daughter, Lucia, 
takes young Casanova's interest when he's invited to a countryside home. They get to know each other over the days, and once more he is infatuated with his newest and greatest object. One day he can take no more of it, takes her into his arms, saying, Let me kiss your tongue a thousand times, and the divine mouth that told me how happy I am. They get busy, and suddenly Lucia jumps out of bed, tidying up and straightening her dress. A good thing, too, because her mother came in an instant later. Days later, once he returns to Venice, however, he resumes his pursuit of Angela. The old habits are hard to kick. And soon Casanova loses his virginity in a night-long threesome with two young sisters that worked with Angela. And this becomes one of his early and most famous conquests. But shooting too far with one girl named Teresa, his patron, Signor Malapiero, kicks him out of his palazzo. He is now 18 and is soon expelled from a seminary in Murano that his mother enrolled him in. He has many adventures now, taking him all around the country, and he takes off his ecclesiastical robes once and for all to pursue a military career while he's back in Venice in 1745, enlisting as a petty officer. Once in uniform while departing a ship for the island of Corfu, a ship's captain who used to be a surgeon thanks Casanova, but Casanova doesn't know why. I find your curiosity a bit indiscreet, he says. You must forgive me, sir, said the ship's captain, since it comes from my gratitude. The captain says that he is also a surgeon and was in poverty until Casanova visited last year. He tells Casanova, you left a little souvenir with Don Galamo's governess, who gave it to a friend, who in good faith shared it with his wife. The captain says in less than a month he had 50 patients with some curable but certainly sexually transmitted ailment Casanova left behind. They share a long laugh, and Casanova says he's clean now, but the captain is sure he won't be for long. When they set sail, four days pass when a strong storm sweeps the seas. The crew is weeping and losing control of the ship, and a priest is exoriating the demons in the clouds to save them. Casanova climbs the rigging amidst the winds and rains and tells the crew, the priest is mad, keep your stations. But the priest convinced the crew that so long as Casanova's aboard, they'll have no good weather. Then Casanova was struck from behind and nearly thrown overboard to certain death, except his coat snags on an anchor and some of the crew manage to pull him up. Thereupon, Casanova takes a truncheon and viciously beats the sailor who shoved him. The priest and some of the crew then engage in a petty skirmish on deck with Casanova and the other soldiers aboard. But when things finally settle down, the priest asks only that Casanova turn over one of the manuscripts he came aboard with. And when the priest burns this on a brazier, suddenly the storms stop and there is peace on deck. Finally arriving to the island, Within a month, he has lost all his money to gambling and has to pawn all his jewels. And back in Venice, he begins to earn his pay by playing the violin in the orchestras, which he doesn't think very highly of, but is happy to be self-sufficient. My profession, he says, was not a noble one, but I did not care. Calling everything a prejudice, I soon acquired all the habits of my lowly comrades. And in this era of his nightlife, he set out after his performances in bad company, getting into tavern brawls, and spending nights in places of ill repute. He says, We spent entire nights roaming through different neighborhoods, conceiving and carrying out the most scandalous pranks. They would untie people's gondolas and watch them bob across the canal, laughing when their owners cursed them. They would send doctors and midwives to the homes of noblemen, alleging that a lady was giving birth, but simply wasting their time with a ruse. If a door was cracked open, they would barge in, screaming, Your door is open, to the residents who fell out of their beds in fright. One night during carnival, he says, midnight had struck, and there were eight of us, all masked, roaming about town, each scheming to distinguish himself in his comrade's eyes by inventing some new sort of prank. They then clear out a restaurant claiming to be members of the Council of Ten, and they take a married woman captive, claiming they will row her across to her house. They settle her down, bring her to an inn, and soon the leader of their band, who is a Venetian nobleman, is making love to the married woman, and she allegedly is fond of it. 
Then Casanova takes his turn, and the whole gang, everyone but Francesco, Casanova's brother, has their way with the woman who is said to have thanked them all as they put on their masks and left. This caused a town-wide scandal and incited a great laugh. Many authorities searched for the culprits but came out with nothing. Months later, Casanova boards a gondola carrying a senator who soon turns numb and is soon to die. Casanova acts fast, jumping off and finding a surgeon who bleeds the man until they get him back to his opulent home. It turned out the senator was famous across Venice and attributed Casanova with saving his life. Casanova uses this situation to his advantage, convincing a doctor he had oracular powers bestowed by the esoteric Hebrew Kabbalah. And with this, he becomes entangled for the first time with so-called gullible persons who believe in magic and occult physics. The art of divination, he says, came easy to me, for I never gave an answer that did not have two meanings. By 1749, the state inquisitors suspect Casanova of Kabbalistic practices. And so he goes on the run to Milan, engaging in many schemes and cons, and he pursues one girl, Henriette, who breaks his heart after wild romances. And in 1750 in Lyon, he is initiated into Freemasonry, takes his blood oath, and goes off to Paris where he learns of the impropriety of theater girls and meets famous persons among the French theater scene and many courtesans. All the Italian actors in Paris, he said, wanted to show off their wealth to me. They invited me to dinners, held parties in my honor. One night a prince invites him to meet an ugly duchess who tries to devour him with drooling lips and he recoils from her in disgust successfully excusing himself by saying he has the clap. Within two years, he spends some time writing plays for his mother's theater company in Dresden, and from there sets off to Vienna at the age of 28. Everything in Vienna was beautiful, he says. There was great wealth and great luxury. But life was very difficult for the devotees of Venus. And in Vienna, he comes down with severe indigestion, and thinking he's soon to die, wakes up in bed to find a doctor and a surgeon about to open his veins with a lancet. Now Casanova, ever distrustful of doctors since his father's death, cries out, no, no, and when the doctor tries to hold him down, Casanova clutches his pistol and fires at the surgeon, managing to hit only a lock of the man's hair, but making them flee nonetheless. In 1753, he's back in Venice, falling in love with Caterina Capretta, who he wants to marry, but her parents do not consent. Casanova becomes entangled with a swindler, Antonio Delacroix, in a gambling scheme, but Antonio is soon banished from Venice. At this stage, Casanova has been arrested multiple times in other countries and cities, and has learned the art of seduction to the point of an admitted weakness for the opposite sex. Cultivating, he says, the pleasures of the senses was my principal concern throughout my life. Casanova writes on occasion very memorable lines, and it is clear he revels in the thrills of life and literature and high society as he sees them. He says, The happiest man is he who understands the art of finding happiness without letting it encroach upon his duties, and the unhappiest is he who has chosen a way of life in which he finds himself with the sad obligation to plan every day from morning till night. And thus Casanova finds himself making love to a nun in her privately adorned casino, full of pillows and delights. And he leaves her the next morning, picking up a letter from Katerina, who he is also still in love with. And she tells him she saw Casanova, speaking with that same nun at the coven's visiting room. Fortunately, she left before she could realize the two had more going on than the dealings of the Lord. As it turned out, the nun was a dear friend of Katerina's, this does nothing to prevent Casanova from designing the most exquisite pleasure boat for another bout with the nun. He furnished a large bed with luxurious cushions, lanterns, scents, and the richest foods. He says, I did things to her that she did not feel she could ask me to do, and I taught her that the slightest constraint spoils the greatest pleasures. When the morning bells tolled, she raised her eyes to the third heaven like an idolatress, thanking the mother and son for having so well rewarded the effort it had cost her to declare her passion for me. 
These episodes with the unnamed nun in Casanova's memoirs get further scandalous when the nun reveals in a letter that her own husband had been watching them make love from a peephole when Casanova visited her. Now Casanova knew the nun was informing the rather open-minded husband about their escapades, but he had no idea he was actually watching them. This letter greatly surprised me, he said. Then after thinking it over, I laughed out loud. Once the fires cool for Katerina and the nun, Casanova moves on to Tonina and then to her sister, Barbarina, all the while suffering massive gambling losses. To resurface above the storm of debts, he sells the nun's diamonds with her consent. But his shady dealings have gone too far now, and the state inquisitors search Casanova's home. And on July 25, 1755, at 30 years old, he is imprisoned under the lead roofs at the Doge's palace, charging him with, as the Venice Tribunal put it, primarily public outrages against the holy religion. No longer could he scheme and seduce with his powdered, scented hair. No longer could he scam noblemen with alleged acts of occult wisdom. His pseudo-occult manuscripts are seized and used against him, and he is now in a dark cell with nothing but his madness for a friend, a madness that naturally accompanies all human beings deprived of life in a dank, lightless torture. I became like a madman, howling and kicking my feet and accompanying With curses and shouts, the useless racket my strained situation excited me to create. Such pitiless abandonment did not seem possible to me, even had I been sentenced to death. But it wasn't death he was sentenced to, but five years. This was too much. And with the blackest hatred and determination, Casanova gradually develops a masterful plan of escape. But with lead roofs in a dark cell with a low ceiling, This was as close to impossible as it comes. But he was at the top floor of the five stories of the Doge's palace, a very famous building and heavily guarded. One day, while he was allowed to walk around for exercise in the attic, he finds a piece of marble and an iron bar, a door bolt. He takes this and carves a chisel from the iron against the marble. He uses this chisel to scrape through the wooden floor of his cell having discovered that the Inquisitor was right beneath him. He knew he could scrape out a hole of escape, but had no idea how to deal with the Inquisitor after that. Nonetheless, coming close to tasting the fruit of this plan, and one day from escape, he never gets the chance. Suddenly his cell is moved down a floor to a larger and lit cell, and soon he devises another plan. He discovers that a priest lives in the cell above him, one who likes to read and the two men begin exchanging letters. Casanova convinces the priest on his escape plan, telling him all he needs to do is break through the floor and then the ceiling. The priest Baldi is on board, and Casanova gives him his chisel, hidden inside a Bible under a plate of pasta. In a week, the priest is about to break through, and Casanova tricks his cellmate into going on with the plan by telling this overly religious man that an angel would come to help them escape tomorrow night. Sure enough, that angel Balbi broke through the ceiling. By now, Casanova has spent 13 months in prison, and he throws everything he has into the escape. Within an hour, he has broken through the cell ceiling to the attic, and he spends four hours making a hundred yards of rope out of the bedsheets. Finally, they burst through the lead plates of the roof, and Casanova pokes his head out to see a crescent moon. So they had to wait until the moon fell, so none of the active persons on the street could see them scampering about the rooftop. At last, the companions emerge into the cool air of freedom. On the summit of the roof, he says, I spent nearly an hour going everywhere, looking, observing, examining. After hours of toiling and problem solving, and nearly slipping off the rooftop, and enduring the priest's last minute fears, Casanova and Balbi realize the palace is too high for their climb down to work. And so Casanova breaks through a dormer and manages to escape by getting out through a corridor inside the palace itself. Now at large, Casanova resumes his adventures away from Venice, and he has changed his name to Chevalier de Saint-Jean. In 1759, he exposes a trick of the mysterious Saint Germain and enjoys more romantic entanglements. He exchanges wits and debates with Voltaire in Switzerland. And in Tuscany, he engages in a relationship with a 13-year-old ballerina. 
In 1760, he is tricked by Karl Ivanov with false bills of exchange and is forced to travel to Rome. And in 1766, he is in Warsaw, where following a theater performance, Casanova and a man, Berniki, argue for who has the privilege of visiting one of the dancers after the performance. Except when Casanova yielded to Berniki, the man calls him a poltroon, or an utter coward. And so Casanova challenges the man to a pistol duel, including in his letter of challenge, Do be so good, my lord, as to take me in your coach and lead me to where my defeat would not compromise you under the laws of Poland, and where I might enjoy the same advantage should God assist me in killing your excellency. And when the duel finally commenced, Casanova writes, I fired at him at exactly the same instant he fired at me. When I saw him fall, I quickly put my left hand, which I had felt had been wounded, in my pocket, tossed my pistol aside and ran at him. Casanova then accompanies the injured opponent back to an inn and helps care for him, and he flees, happy that he didn't kill Berniki, an official of the crown, because he would have surely been executed. Nonetheless, he's ordered to leave Warsaw by the king, and when he travels to Vienna, he's forced to leave by order of the empress for other matters. And in 1769, his loose tongue to a count will once again result in him having to leave Madrid. But in Barcelona, he has a wild affair with the mistress of the Captain General of Catalonia. This lands him yet again in prison at the age of 44, where he spends his weeks there writing The Refutation of the History of the Government of Venice. Making it back to Italy, he takes a tour of every city, expecting the old thrill he used to enjoy. But now age and his fading looks have made things difficult. He is less enthusiastic about his chances, and certainly grappling with the fading ecstasies of youth he used to indulge. He one time convinces an older woman to sleep with him in order to bring her son back to life, and he still manages to seduce a few more beautiful young women, and after much time passes, he's allowed back to Venice until he writes a satire against the Venetian nobility. He wrote dramas and several novels, translated Homer's Iliad into Italian, and in 1785, having developed his literary skills throughout his life, aided by the many cultured and traveled experiences he collected, he is employed as a librarian in the castle of Count Waldstein in Bohemia. Here he began writing his memoirs in 1791, a 3,600-page manuscript that remained unfinished at the time of his death in 1798. Ultimately, Casanova is not a man to want to live up to in many regards, but he offers us a lens into an entirely different world, embodying the archetype of the trickster and hedonist to its closest approximation of a philosophic way of life, which it most certainly isn't in the classic definition of philosophy. Nonetheless, Casanova believed in divinity, saying, I believe in the existence of an immortal God, creator and master of all forms. But he does find himself at extreme odds with the Stoics, who shunned notions of pleasure in a manner that Casanova equates to atheism itself. And he is not necessarily the best salesman of his own philosophy, considering he often comes out of his gambling and courting sprees, a twisted mess of debts, heartbreaks, and in the nauseating defeat of one too many romantic entanglements. There is a lesson to be learned in that, and yet he makes no apologies for it and damn if he didn't damn himself in at least half the eyes of history by admitting to all the affairs and perversions he indulged in. You will laugh, he says, when you learn that I thought nothing of deceiving idiots, scoundrels, and fools when I needed to do so. As for my deceptions of women, these are not the sort to be tallied, since when love has a hand in things, each party usually dupes the other. Fools, however, are entirely another matter. I always take great delight in remembering those I have lured into my traps. I hesitate to praise him, but then again I take no pleasure in faulting him. We can't simply impose modern sensibilities on the past and think they should have lived up to our own lofty standards, sinless ourselves as we often pretend. But like any gray character in the stories we love, Casanova draws out of us a sense of adventure and excitement and causes us to have been fortunate enough to have laid claim on some wild adventures ourselves, to reflect on our lives without regret, prying out the mysteries of nature and God that sneak into our experience from time to time to show us there is always more going on than our personal victories and despairs. 
He tempts us to go boldly into the unknown, even if we're poor and lacking confidence, especially in the arena of seduction, which many young men in these times could benefit from, so long as it's balanced with morality and fair intentions, conforming to the age limits and consent of modern society. And if our life doesn't benefit from the guidelines of morality, well, life has a way of sorting it all out in one punishment or another, as it surely did with Casanova. His memoirs are a treasure of many more adventures and scandals, as if the man lived simply for the pleasure of writing the stories later in his life. From his keen young mind to his travels around the world and noble courts of his time, Casanova will forever rest on the highest pedestal of history's great seducers and scoundrels. And he sticks fondly to his pursuit of self-satisfaction, writing, In recalling the pleasures I enjoyed, I relive them, while I laugh at the pains I endured and no longer feel. At the age of 72, when I can say I lived even though I still breathe, I can think of no greater amusement than to entertain myself with my own adventures and give dignified cause for laughter to the good company listening to me, who have always shown me friendship and whose society I've always frequented. That same year when he wrote these words, while in Bohemia in 1797, Napoleon Bonaparte seizes Venice, and the very next year Casanova dies, leaving his memoirs to the laughter of the world.